Down through the years, he had a phrase that he repeated like a personal mantra to hold at bay anyone who pressed him too closely about the meaning of his work or his own intentions. It came from an essay by H.P. Lovecraft, and like Stephen King, a popular manipulator of the occult, in all things that are mysterious, never explain, it said. The edict applies to Kubrick's own work as well, but also even more to himself. From the book by Walker, Taylor, and Rook D called Stanley Kubrick, Director. Generally considered one of the best horror films of all time, Kubrick's adaptation of the Stephen King story The Shining is not lacking in its interpretive creativity on the part of film critics and analysts. Freudian psychoanalysts combined with esoteric speculation generally garners much of the review space, but in my estimation, The Shining is about something much more obvious and yet obscure at the same time. I believe the film adaptation is intended to convey the same message as King's, and that is demonic possession. It's not merely a presentation of the possession of Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson, but of the spectral haunting of America itself, in terms of its dark past and relationship to Native Americans, and much more. Is there something to the idea of America as an ancient Indian burial ground? This is in the background of Stephen King's novel of horror and possession. And the idea of the Overlook Hotel is that it's built on an ancient Indian burial ground. This becomes, of course, the scene for the terrifying paranormal uh, events that occur in Poltergeist as well as The Shining. But I think that what's interesting is that we're asking a question about spiritual forces. Is there, a, is there a principle or a power of good and evil that lies at the heart of the foundation of America's own ancient past? And I want to add that if you like this analysis, you can get more of the same in my book, Esoteric Hollywood Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film, at jaysanalysis.com. Esoteric Hollywood covers the biggest films and the biggest directors with 404 footnotes and 363 pages definitely something that you want to check out. Signed copies are available at jasonanalysis.com at the tab. Note as well that the book has in its first nine months over a hundred five-star reviews and it also led to the creation of my TV show with Jay Widener, Hollywood Decoded, available at Gaia TV. In the film, as we'll see, it's indigenous animistic spiritualism that undergirds the narrative and it manifests as a form of generational curse upon Jack as we'll see. Initially, the camera perspective appears to fly in from an aerial vantage point as if we were viewing the scene from the perspective of a disembodied spirit or a demon. From the camera's angle, we can also see the lake and the reflection suggests a as above, so below motif where a lonely islet in the midst of vast mountains sits reflecting the isolation of both nature and the isolation that Jack himself seeks as he flees to the Overlook Hotel to escape family life. Signifying isolation, Jack's desire to be rid of his family is thus conveyed by this natural landscape. The mirrors and reflections that we see here are also prominently displayed throughout the movie. And I think the point of this is that just like Alice in Wonderland mirrors connote the spiritual realm or another world or the psyche we're going to be looking into that spiritual realm and into the psyche throughout this film hovering over the mountains the viewer gradually comes to spot jack winding towards the ominous overlook hotel in colorado built in 1907 the site was chosen for its seclusion and scenic beauty but there's a darker side of this locale it seems to draw dark forces into its midst as a kind of spiritual vortex while the hotel is real, we discover that in Jack's mind it begins to take on an otherworldly portal association. Jack has, in fact, chosen this location purposely for his writing. The story will be his next novel. However, the real story is not the novel, but the gruesome reenactment of a spiritual ritual sacrifice that is required for his imagined entrance into this Hall of Fame of the Elite. The abode of the beautiful people and the jet set, as the film says. Arriving at the hotel, Jack and his new masters become acquainted. That is, the all-American manager himself, Stuart Ullman, 
a facilitator of horrors, orgies, and abuse. Yes, the interview scene conveys an overtly Americana facade that clues the viewer into the dual symbolism of the film, where the overlook is both Jack's degenerating psyche and it's a microcosm of the United States. With a friendly, charming veneer, the baby boomer generation has a dark side that is betrayed both figuratively and literally in Jack's brutality at the mystic locale of the Overlook. In this scene, America is not baseball and apple pie, and manager Ullman's JFK-esque appearance masks his own potential to actually be a nefarious character. While surrounded by the icons of Americana, we see flags and paintings of Native American artworks that shows the displacement of the previous civilization. It's worth noting, as Rob Ager has shown in his documentaries, that the Playgirl issue that Jack is seen reading, oddly enough, at a hotel, why is a Playgirl laying out to be read at a hotel, actually deals with incest in that very issue. This is a big key to interpreting the film, because we learn that, of course, later on, it is Jack who is incestuously abusing his son, Danny. Now, it's also important to see that the photos in Ullman's office appear to be the same that will conclude the film. Ullman reveals to Jack that the history of the caretakers involves a previous mass murder where cabin fever resulted in an instance of madness and violent outbursts. Danny, we start to learn, has a special talent by which he can actually presage the future, identified in the film's title, The Shining. Critics Walker, Taylor, and Rookty explain, highlighting my point about animism in Native American traditions as follows. Carruthers, played by Dick Halloran, is a great casting success. His talent for shining springs from the animism associated with black culture. But Carruthers' features, ancient and weathered like the Easter Island Monument, also lend more gravitas. He's the hero, although he is a sacrificial hero. Jack explains to Ullman that his wife, Wendy, played by Shelley Duvall, is a confirmed ghost story and horror film fanatic. As we see from the imagery in the Torrance apartment, Wendy actually shares an interest in the occult. This includes numerous books on witchcraft, as well as a notorious Catcher in the Rye book associated with several MK Ultra assassins. Because Jack has come to despise his family, he thinks that they are a stumbling block to his, his supposed greatness, and thus the dark depths of his subconscious will suggest, through the whispers of the demonic, that he could write a real horror story for Wendy and Danny. Following his father's job interview, Danny experiences a supernatural premonition, a seizure and dissociating blackout, sensing intuitively that the trauma they are destined to undergo in the Overlook Hotel is soon to come. We begin to suspect that Danny has been abused, possibly sexually, as his alternate persona based around trauma-based mind control named Tony lives in Danny's mouth and stomach, we're told. In my opinion, the usage of the inverted stars here on Danny's shirt intensify the reality of the demonic. It was used intentionally because we later discover that Jack has, in fact, physically and sexually assaulted Danny, resulting in his traumatic break and the mental creation of the multiple Tony. Interestingly, in accounts of indigenous religions and spiritual possessions, there are instances of spirits inhabiting certain areas and regions of the body in just this way. Indeed, as film analyst Rob Ager has correctly elucidated, the abuse appears to be generational and intergenerational conflict shows in this way Freudian Oedipal envy, that is, Jack resents Danny, and will occupy much of the story. Ager is also correct in his insights concerning the cartoon programming that Danny has apparently received, as Jack will become the big bad wolf at the end, utilizing the Disney and nursery rhyme mantras during his psychosis. This is also why cartoons and cartoon characters are consistently displayed throughout the film, as you see here on the door. Numerous references are made to fairy tales such as Hansel and Gretel, as well as the classical works of mythology in regard to Theseus and the labyrinth's Minotaur. Fairy tales and mythical references are thus profuse. 
Eager is also perceptive to connect the old hag in the bathtub, as we see later in the film, to the classic notions of the seductive sea nymph or the siren who transforms into a hag, causing sailors to then crash upon the rocks to their despair and demise. This omen will appear and apply to Jack as he progresses down his path of possession. Looking over the books visible in Wendy's living room, we can see an interest in witchcraft in the books titled The Magic Circle and Mother Goddess. As the counselor learns that Jack dislocated Danny's shoulder in a drunken rage, we begin to wonder, is it maybe Jack who is the witch? Wendy, however, is partly to blame in all this for her, her uh, naivety and enabling and overlooking the trauma that Jack has caused against Danny and against her better judgment. She tries to convince herself that Jack has changed and believes in his empty promise. Recall as well that the magic circle appeared in Kubrick's film Eyes Wide Shut that we highlighted in my other documentary video. It appears that Danny has arranged also, as we saw previously, the cartoon stickers in his room in a kind of magic ritual circle. Concerning the Minotaur and the film's art direction, critics Walker Taylor and Rook denote, Kubrick often positions Nicholson visually against extremely formal backgrounds. One image frames him in the abstract design of a wall tapestry, a Native American motif. It also resembles a printed circuit. It calls to mind the rigor of programmed information. No deviation is allowed. In another shot, Torrance looms above a model of the garden maze. This maze clearly alludes to the Minotaur myth in which a monster with the head of a bull and the body of a man was kept in a labyrinth and fed on human flesh, cannibalism, until the hero, Theseus, killed it. It was a legend that had long appealed to Kubrick. The company that made Killer's Kiss 25 years ago before was called Minotaur Productions. In his film, environment is destiny and not its instrument. As the now evidently dysfunctional family journeys to their nightmare abode, Jack posits a macabre topic for discussion. The reality of cannibalism as a drive that is necessary for survival as he sneers at Danny's awareness of what he saw on television. Jack displays his psychopathic, parasitic side in a glimpse, a premonition of what horrors await. Here, as is crucial to note, and as Ager has shown in his analysis, Jack apparently has homosexual proclivity despite his exterior masculine framework. He is apparently playing a fatherly role, but as he tours the hotel, and as Ullman reveals the secret of the outlook, we learn that it was formerly a getaway for the moneyed elites, for the Hollywood jet set and royalty, all the best people, we're told. Kubrick's dour view of the American aristocracy and the middle class is reflected in their offspring, represented in the film by both Jack and the younger generation in Danny. The hotel is not merely a site for elite orgies or lascivious dalliances, but a representative sacrificial site where the dead are fed upon and feed upon parasitically the fear in living organisms. The scene will also appear in my analysis of Twin Peaks. We also learn in this scene, interestingly, that the Monarch Mind Control program, which was a real program, is subtly referenced in the film behind the two twins that represent Gemini. Notice also behind the two twins there appears to be some sort of poster that looks like it has a minotaur or bull horns on display. Now with this monarch program being referenced, I think that it's fascinating that Kubrick was apparently aware of MK Ultra mind control and its experiments done on children. These experiments are actually detailed in certain MK Ultra doctors books like programming and metaprogramming the human biocomputer as well as Kubrick documenting it in his film A Clockwork Orange, which involves operant conditioning through Pavlovian means and methods, as well as drug administration to socially engineer the public. Timidly touring the hotel, Wendy anxiously refers to it as a maze, like the hotel's garden, sprinkling her dialogue with references to cartoon characters and nursery rhymes. Danny is spoken of as lost, signifying both a literal and a figurative sense, looking for his parents. He has been abandoned. 
His parents, of course, fixate on the landscape, leaving him forgotten in the, quote, game room. Jack rhetorically comments on Danny's playfulness. Did you get tired of bombing the universe, Danny? Signifying Danny's representation of youthful American aggression in terms of his generation. The great enlightenment experiment that sits upon the giant Indian burial ground, the United States, is also being signified here, I think, and Kubrick was very much a critic of Americanism, especially its foreign policy, as we can see in films like Dr. Strangelove, where the absurdity of mutually assured Cold War destruction and the Rand Corporation are lampooned. The Cold War great game was truly a game room of the theater of war, making Kubrick's critique of Western imperialism here appropriate. Danny, we recall, had seen a vision of the murdered twins in the game room, while behind him on the scene is a poster that reads, Monarch. Given Danny's representation of both traumatized youth and naive America, Monarch can also be applied to the nation in mass. Since, as I propose, the MK Ultra abominations were really about mass mind control and not primarily about programmed assassins. Kubrick is thus gradually revealing Danny's abuse, trauma, and mind control at the hand of his father, Jack. The Minotaur has a significance in terms of human sacrifice, which is a dark side of the film, as we'll see, in relation to the myth of Theseus. Originally a human sacrifice tale, according to scholar Nigel Davies, on the history of this practice, he writes, perhaps the most famous concerns Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus was already a hero of many tales, including the killing of Procrustes, another slayer of men. Athens paid an annual tribute of seven youths and seven maidens to Minos, king of Crete. These he shut up in the labyrinth, where they either lost their way and died of hunger, or were eaten by the Minotaur half man, half bull. In 1998, the CBC did an important investigation into the history of Project MKUltra, and specifically the Mind Control Institute in Canada. Even if you don't know the history of the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, it looks like a natural setting for a movie. A horror movie, maybe. But then, the truth about what happened to hundreds of psychiatric patients there a long time ago is a horror story. Okay, so we're en route, guys, a piece of Leon. And now, it has become a movie. A dramatized account of a bleak chapter in the history of Canadian psychiatry, produced by a former Fifth Estate documentary maker, Bernard Zuckerman. I literally could not make change for a dollar. The central character in the TV movie is a world-renowned psychiatrist at the Allen in the early 60s. His name was Dr. Ewan Cameron. Dr. Cameron. It's the classic story of good turning to evil in its most simplistic terms. I mean, Dr. Cameron started off as someone who was probably one of the most enlightened psychiatrists in the country. But then something happened. And whatever happened, suddenly here is this enlightened doctor, this noble doctor, who begins doing more and more and more bizarre experiments on his patients to the point where he is destroying the minds of hundreds of people. These are the days and hours are the occasion. Inspired by the exuberant post-war optimism in technology, Cameron thought he'd achieved a major scientific breakthrough, how to repair a damaged human mind. The media rejoiced even coined a phrase which would become a tragically silly oxymoron, beneficial brainwashing. Linda McDonald was a young mother with five children under the age of five when she started feeling low. Her family doctor knew just the man to make her better. I was tired, I was depressed, my back was hurting. And so he said to the children's father, why don't you go to Montreal and visit this Dr. Ewan Cameron, this famous man who has all of these accolades, and have an assessment. So we went. My medical file even says that I took my guitar with me. And uh, that was the end of my life. Within three weeks, Dr. Cameron decided to call me an acute schizophrenic and ship me up to the sleep room. How long did they put you to sleep for? I was in a, a, a coma for 86 days. 86, 86 days of unbroken sleep. Yeah. 
total comatose state. The theory was simple. Erase a disturbed mind and start all over again. One of Dr. Cameron's colleagues at the time was Dr. Peter Roper. The aim, I think, really was to wipe out the patterns of thought and behavior which were detrimental to the patient, which were sick, and replace them with healthy patterns of thought and behavior. I think this may have been um, stimulated by the effects of the uh, American prisoners of war in Korea, how they seem to have been brainwashed. And the movie called The Sleep Room dramatizes one technique for brainwashing. Extreme sessions of electroshock therapy, massive jolts of electricity three or four times a day for weeks. According to her hospital records, Linda McDonald had 100 of these treatments. She entered hospital for treatment of what we can now guess was postpartum depression. Her records show the results of shock and radical drug therapy. May 15th shows some confusion. June 3rd knows her name, but that's about all. June 11th doesn't know her name. I was, had to be toilet trained. I was a vegetable. I had no identity, I had no memory, I'd never existed in the world before. I'm like a baby. Just like a baby that has to be toilet trained. She eventually went home, her depression gone, and her entire previous life gone with it. And this is, this is one of the twins. In, in, it was in 62 before I went to the island. And this is the same one, I think. I just look at the pictures and I know who that is, who they are. But I don't remember them as my children at all. Monarch is thus also connected with the various mind control programs of the CIA. Indeed, it's one of the programs. It seeks the creation directly of alternate personas and is often mentioned, mentioned under the umbrella term of MKUltra. This includes projects Bluebird, Artichoke, and Naomi. These are centered on mass mind control and whispers of creating dissociative states and altered consciousness through LSD, torture, and traumatization. The film certainly uses this narrative as well as Kubrick in uh, Clockwork Orange, as we said. And here we have reference to Jack's abuse of Danny and the altar spirit being created as a result of the trauma of Tony. The game room reference to Monarch and the frequent use of mazes and labyrinths in, throughout the film signifies compartmentalizations of the psyche. This is the meaning of room 237, where traumas are stored and released in the hotel itself. Jack's exhaustion and sleep state are accompanied by images of butterflies, signifying, I think, his transformation, as you see here. We also see mirrors. Mirrors represent the subconscious, the psyche, or the inner world that is reflected in our minds from the outer world, as well as signifying the spiritual realm or some other location, such as Alice in Through the Looking Glass, which closely parallels our own world, where much of the shining is taking place. In this scene, it is Jack once again hinting that he is writing a, ghost, a ghostly horror that is not the book, but his own reality. In fact, this is evident in numerous scenes where Jack is shown in a mirror or a fade scene. The maze itself is interesting for its dual usage. It symbolizes both Jack's psyche and his writing of the fiction into reality. And thus the viewer begins to discover that the principle of simulacrum is at work here, where the modeled things become real in preparatory phases for later fulfillment. I highlight this in many of my Spielberg essays, specifically in regard to Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T., where directors function like shamans or omegas for signifying events to come through models earlier in the film. Through symbolic objects like toys, uh, operating like a voodoo doll in a way in Close Encounters, for example, or in E.T. or A.I. Such objects later appear in the film and thus are a kind of fulfillment. Roy's mashed potatoes and television programs such as the Ten Commandments, where Moses receives the law on Mount Sinai like Devil's Mountain in the film, portend future events. Like Devil's Mountain in Close Encounters, the Overlook Hotel is situated on a, quote, high place where the spirits of the dead meet with man and demand an exchange. The models in Roy's house also, in Close Encounters, become real later 
as the government stages a, stra a staged outbreak during a train sequence. I propose that this is not merely a plot device or a choice of nostalgic Im imagery, but instead an attempt to script reality by writing one's own twilight language, just like Jack. Twilight language is a form of angelic script that integra integrates synchronistic events and a kind of semiotic text to be read, while other directors like King, Kubrick, and Steven Spielberg are operating in the role of the Magus to produce the dramaturgical ritual that communicates with the subconscious. This is also why mazes and labyrinths have historically been associated with the underworld and the psyche or the subconscious, as we will see in both Henson Lucas's production of Labyrinth, uh, as in many other films that we delve into, including Eyes Wide Shut. In the process of the in of individuation, Jungian scholar M. L. von Franz explains the meaning of the labyrinth as the subconscious. Quote, the maze of strange passages, chambers, and unlocked secrets and exits in the cellar recall the old Egyptian representation of the underworld, which is a well-known symbol of the unconscious with its mysterious abilities. It also show, shows how one is open to other influences in one's unconscious shadow side and how uncanny and alien elements can in fact break. Simulacra is important to semiotics, but it is also an important in the role Simulacra is important to semiotics, but it also has an important role in esotericism because of the idea of correspondences. Before modern philosophy divorced metaphysics from academia, the holistic view of the sciences in the Western traditions in included the idea of essentialism, which is connected to the idea of essences, that things have some mystical association between referent and symbol. Thus, there would be an association between the symbol of the maze, the model, and its referent, the actual maze. This is a deep and difficult subject that gets into some pretty heavy philosophy and semiotics, but the idea is simply foreign to modern philosophy because of stupidity. Plato discussed simulacrum, and we can see simulacra in things like Spielberg's Jurassic Park, where the simulation of a theme park shows simulations of simulations, or dinosaurs. Hollywood, just like esotericism, or like writing itself, is the manipulation of copies, signs, and symbols. E.T. is about symbols, language, and meaning just like Close Encounters. And we are constantly given camera angles and shots in E.T., for example, from a child's perspective. This is reminiscent of the Hortus Palantius, where we see a garden maze that is similar to the maze of the Overlook Hotel. The Hortus Palantius was the alchemical garden from the 17th century, known as the Eighth Wonder of the World, constructed by Elector Frederick Palantine V, for his wife, Elizabeth Stewart. According to Enlightenment scholar Dame Frances Yates, the garden signified the Rosicrucian mysteries, both regrets, both regents, and friends of Francis Bacon, it should be noted. Largely destroyed during the Thirty Years' War, the garden mazes are replete with esoteric symbology. According to Yates, we can see in Kubrick's maze that same principle at work. In fact, while looking at the image of the maze, uh, in the film, we notice how similar it is to a mandala and a sigil. This connection is not tenuous. Oxford anthropologist and comparative religion scholar John Layard outlines this in his work, The Malakulon Journey of the Dead, where the indigenous religious mythology of the Malakulon tribe's after-death journey is drawn from the pattern formations that appear in the natural sacred geometry of the tortoise shell. Not only is this seen as a kind of math puzzle, it's also a maze and a pathway for the dead that resembles a sigil. Malakulan mazes and sigils signify the journey of the soul after death, as we can see, constructed in a way that resembles a mandala. Apart from a diamond-shaped center uh, unconnected with the other parts, the whole is designed to form a single, never-ending line. These are only a few examples of the pure art that has developed in the Malakulan tribe out of the labyrinth motif combined with that derived from the outline of the human form itself, or the anthropocosmic principle. The sibyl of classical and medieval lore may well be compared with the Malakulan female devouring ghost sitting beside her cave guarding the labyrinth. Though caves and clefts guarded by these mythical figures and heroes of antiquity started their journey to the underworld to visit their shades and ancestors, however, much more can be derived here. Virgil describes such a descent in the sixth book of the Aeneid in which Aeneas goes to the underworld. Hitherto, scholars have 
understandably failed to appreciate why, in the introduction to his book, the Latin poet interrupts his otherwise consecutive tale with a now apparently unintelligible interpolation concerning a labyrinth. Aeneas, who has finally landed at Cume on Latin soil, approaches a cave guarded by the Sibyl through, Sibyl through which he wishes to descend to Hades. But here Virgil, often criticized for a passage that has nothing to do with the story, breaks off into account the description of a representation of the Cretan labyrinth depicted at the entrance of the cave. Night is its symbolic place, but for the Roman leader, the scene could be changed and charged with all kinds of emotional connections with initiation rites at the journey into the land of the dead. In this same book of the Aeneid are also described two different waters outside that flows the Styx nine times around and the river of death, which Aeneas can only be ferried over which, which once he has shown the Sibyl the famous golden bow or magic wand, which, judging from the Malakulan evidence, is his own counterpart or spiritual double. Inside he must come to the Letha, which is the waters of forgetfulness, leading to the inner life, which for full initiation he must immerse himself in to achieve the new life on earth. The mandala-esque design of the same tribe illustrates both the psyche and the human form showing an anthropic principle. The esoteric and literary tropoi in the connection to Jack Torrance become obvious. Jack's own psyche is plunging into the underworld maze of his dark persona as he is already under the reign of death through gradual possession. This makes perfect sense with the infamous scene with Jack staring at the model of the maze that morphs into a real maze. The underworld here is Jack's psyche where like the Minotaur in the mythology of Theseus and the labyrinth, Danny will battle the bullish beast in the center of the labyrinth. This explains why Jack even seems to have a kind of bullish appearance, as well as a devilish minotaur that appears in the hallway of the game room when Danny sees the omen of the murdered twins. These two twins, I should note, are Gemini, and the film takes place in May, the month in which the Zodiac transitions from Taurus the Bull to Gemini. Uh, or the Minotaur Jack to the twins, which I think is obviously intentional. The omen of the murdered twins seen by Danny, along with the vision of the river of blood gushing from the elevator, I think is biblical in nature, recalls the curses in the book of Exodus upon Egypt. It is also possible that the twins have a twin towers significance, since in masonry the twin pillars are Yakin and Boaz, which signify a doorway or portal to the temple which is also the meaning of Gemini in Babylonian mythology. This makes one puzzle, given the title of Kubrick's masterpiece 2001 A Space Odyssey and the events of September 11th, 2001, as we will see in my 2001 analysis. Room 237, in my estimation, does not relate to the moon directly, although I do think Widener is correct to point out the images of Danny in terms of his Apollo shirt, referencing NASA utilizing Kubrick and front screen projection, most likely. I'm doubtful that the number change from King's novel is really about the distance to the moon. I think 237, at the beginning of the location of the number of the twins, is supposed to be foreshadowed in the murder of another child, Danny, who wears a shirt number 42. That is, 2 times 3 times 7 equals 42. This is also why the film that Wendy, or Danny, and Wendy and Danny are watching is the 1971 film Summer of 42, which is a reverse Lolita-style tale of an older woman seducing a younger boy. The second reference to pedophilia in Danny's number 42 shirt clues us into that. Note that Kubrick also directed Lolita. News reports forecast the coming snowstorm and we see Jack fall deeper into his trance states and demonic glares as Wendy and Danny begin to feel the drag of cabin fever. Danny's shining kicks in, that is his premonition and sixth sense powers, and he begins to see more terrifying images as Tony tells him it's just like the pictures in the book, it isn't real. Highlighting the surrealist dream state and aspects of this film, Walker, Taylor, and Ruckty again comment the Shining was also a perfect closed set, like Barry Lyndon. The film Barry Lyndon dispersed the action across vast landscapes and stands alone in that respect, for Kubrick has always been happiest within the walls of a soundstage, enfolding him and protecting him. 
to work in a studio concentrates his mind, he believes, and helps his players to focus on their psychic energy. Up to now, we might conceivably have believed that all of Jack's apparitions are lived out in his own schizophrenia, but once the storeroom bolts are physically drawn back and we see Jack escape through the help of Grady, liberating Torrance to commence his assault on the family, the tables are turned on us. The ghosts aren't one's imagination. They are real. The psychic energy that inhabits the Overlook is exceedingly nefarious, and particularly room 237 and Jack. But if you pay attention to the sequence and its scenes, it is my contention that they are somewhat out of order. When Danny is discovered to be beaten and abused, Wendy later thinks that it was the old hag in room 237, and no longer Jack who is the culprit. Rather, it is the hag who possesses Jack to do this, and Danny's experience of the event was seeing one of the spirits who possessed him. This is the explanation of the scene where Jack investigates the bathroom and sees the beautiful naked woman becoming the hag, invoking the mythology of the sirens of the sea mentioned earlier. The scenes are thus told from Jack's vantage point, while others are Danny's spiritual vantage point through Tony, his dissociative identity disorder alter. It seems to be a real spirit, in other words. Jack, almost fully possessed, says that Danny is the one that hurt himself, gaslighting a willfully deluded Wendy, who con continues to fail to see the evil of Jack himself, possibly due to her own occluded view of spirits through dabbling in witchcraft. And she does see the spirits later in the film. While the notion of a monarch mind-controlled slave might seem outlandish, it's fascinating to observe that mainline Kubrick scholars conclude that it is apparently what the film's narrative concerns. In the popular conspiracy vernacular, the reasoning of course goes that the CIA and various secret societies have raised certain persons to be traumatized victims of a kind of occult brainwashing, able to be triggered at various moments through various triggers and codes. In my estimation, it's definitely the case that generational bloodline families do traumatize their offspring and often do raise them in the occult and will, in this sense, program them. What happens in The Shining is that Jack is himself probably traumatized, and thus he seeks to traumatize his son and family or else to sacrifice them for entrance into what he perceives to be the elite or the greatness. He believes himself to be stalled due to his family duties, and previously mentioned mainstream Kubrick analysts even admit this. The scene between Nicholson and Stone has a cool comic civility that turns downright chilly as the spook gives Torrance his orders to kill his family. The actors serve Kubrick impeccably. They play the masquerade with relish for its pintoresque undertones, only hinting at by Grady's use only hinted at by Grady's use of a choice word like correction, as if it were the trigger word for Torrance's programmed psychosis. And note as well the similarity between the eyes wide shut ball here on the left as we pan over into the gold ball, the gold room, the alchemical process, supposedly, at least in the dark sense of what Jack's psyche is becoming. As the horrifying scenes approach the climax, and with Dick being murdered and the family on the run, I'm reminded of the elements of storytelling that would later be used by directors like Lynch or Linklater, where the surrealist dream state blends seamlessly with the waking state to create an encote mystical formlessness to reality as merely an external projection of the inner psyche, supposedly. Carl Jung, as well as many in the Hermetic traditions, have proposed this view where ultimately the realization of man's own inner divinity is premised on a kind of waking state moving towards an enlightenment uh, which is akin to some far eastern religious thought. Critic Rob Ager is excellent in explicating the various perspectives on the dream states and the various usages of cartoons, particularly from Danny's vantage point in the film. While I often disagree with Ager's analysis of Kubrick overall, he is correct when he notes the significance of Tony in this scene. By far the biggest giveaway is Danny's description of how his own of his own psychic episodes. Halloran asks Danny how his imaginary friend Tony tells him things and Danny replies, it's like I go to sleep and he shows me, but when I wake up I can't remember anything. Remember that Danny is also has his very first psychic episode and as a result is found unconscious. All he says is that I remember 
uh, mommy waking me up. Much later in the film, Danny is heard in the bedroom shouting, Red Rob, Red Rob. His mother enters the room and shakes him, and thus ensuing dialogue again hints at the nightmare nature of these visions. Wake up, Danny, you had a bad dream. Daddy can't wake up, Mrs. Torrance. Daddy's gone away, Mrs. Torrance. In philosophy, or at least in the Western tradition, and in Far Eastern traditions, mastering the inner worlds leads to a mastering of the outer world as the initiate or the enlightened one meditates to achieve a perceptive unity between the subconscious dream realm and the phenomena of waking experience. Plato discussed this, for example, and elucidating this Freudian element is also prominent in Kubrick films, as we said before. So what is the meaning of all these horrifying epiphanies? Freud said that film going is like a wakeful dream, and Kubrick also believed that the films, in connection with uh, repeat viewing, subtly influence the subconscious. Meaning, he said, may be found in the sensation of a thing and not in its explanation. This is contrary to Plato. Yet, he has provided a clue here. In certain interviews around this time, uh, he mentioned his admiration for Rhapsody, a dream novel, which is a novella, really, by Arthur Schnitzler. In Rhapsody, the main character, a wealthy young doctor in Vienna, passes almost imperceptibly in and out of a dream state, experiencing seduction, erotic longing, and unrequited passion as if they were events in his waking state. Kubrick's hankering to make a film of Schnitzler's novel uh, probably goes back to his cinema beginnings, which he finally achieved in a, in a certain manner with Eyes Wide Shut. And this is why we are correct to bring into focus here the waking state and the dream state, something that Plato had discussed millennia ago. Ultimately, the film concludes with a form of eternal recurrence, as is shown, for example, in David Lynch's Lost Highway, where the end of the film culminates in a Baphomet-style pose of Jack amongst the best people the boom era of 1921, where the jet-set Hollywood stars and royalty are shown to be the ghastly, parasitic inhabitants of the Overlook. Demanding Jack offer up the blood of his family as his duty, it's Jack's envy of the good life that he felt he deserved as a failed writer, which is a combination of the resentment that, is, uh, that he blames with, upon his family, uh, that he places blame on his family, and we are reminded here of Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, or again of the character Fred Madison in The Lost Highway by David Lynch, obviously influenced by Kubrick. Bear suit, bare bottom, writes Rob Eger. Is this a pun? Is Kubrick using a sly visual metaphor to reveal certain characters in the film, such as Jack and Ullman, bare-faced liars, being the two bears in the film that have teeth that are one in the Colorado Lounge, uh, excuse me, that have teeth, are the one in the Colorado Lounge represented Jack, the fellatio bear, and are we to conclude that Wendy uh, actually sees Jack giving fellatio instead of somebody else? Absolutely. As it turns out, the abuse suffered by Danny is something that has been passed down through the generation. Abused children grow up to become abused uh, abusers themselves and repeat the sins of their parents in a continuous cycle. Jack's demonic bidders offer him some special place amongst the privileged, he thinks, if he's willing to rid himself of the family. This is why the issue of the playgirl at the beginning of the film contained the story of incest as well as why the hotel has been the site of lush masquerades, balls, and orgies of the jet set and sexual deviance, and even furries, something that was not widely known at this time. We're reminded here of Eyes Wide Shut, which focuses on the same notions of elite perversion, sex magic, and secret societies. Although we have and see no evidence of secret societies in this film overtly, Ullman seems to have familiarity with young women who frequent the, the lodge, who are possibly prostitutes. Kubrick's love theme, uh, or love of the theme of eternal recurrence and possibly reincarnation, is also seen in 2001 with Bowman and Star Child. God here is an, uh, in 2001 is an advanced AI that humans created long ago and through its own 
self-advancing self-realization the ai thus creates its own virtual matrix that we know as the universe in 2001 bowman breaks free of plato's cave to cheat death and rise to a rebirth amongst the gods and in the process he repeats an eternal return with a new genesis bowman simply evolves as uh, aliens show him the way, granting him apotheosis. Either way, it is the cyclical return, the eternal return process of a time-bound emergent deity arising from within the cosmos, and not an eternal deity who alone subsists outside time and space who created ex nihilo. Jack's experience is similar in ways to Bill Harford's experience in Eyes Wide Shut. While they are, of course, very different characters, like the Indian burial ground upon which the hotel is built, it becomes a site of ritual chant and ritual enactment, as Wendy's flight from Jack features background music of actual Native American chanting. This is similar to the masked ball music in Eyes Wide Shut. The sacrifice is thus the climax of the film and a kind of dark liturgy, where the release of blood will satiate the powers of darkness, like the man from another place in uh, Twin Peaks, for example. Like the mazes of M.C. Escher, or a strange loop of eternal return, the punishment uh, that Jack undergoes here, and he, that he, what he concocts for himself, is a kind of psychical prison, failing to complete his task, as he was ordered by Grady, and thus uh, is in a way damned. He's frozen like the damned souls of the traitors near Satan in Dante's Inferno. This is worth noting that Dante, Dante also made reference to the Minotaur, which relates to the obligations that Grady placed upon Jack. My sage cried out to him, You think perhaps this is the Duke of Athens, Theseus? Who in the world put you to death? Get away, you beast, for this man does not come tutored by your sister. He comes to view your punishments. Inferno, Canto 12. The Shining, then, is a kind of ghost story, but it's something much more uh, esoteric in Kubrick's mind. It's a multi-layered exploration of the psyche, the spiritual realm, and surrealism, as well as ancient mythology and the satanic occult elite that rule America. It is also a theme that tries to explore. It also deals with the theme of the pedophilic generational bloodlines that parasitically manipulate the underclass through the false promise of otherworldly prosperity. In Jack, Danny, and the Overlook Hotel, in its magnificent maze, we have real America again in a microcosm, situated on an old Indian burial ground. For Kubrick, then, The Shining functions on many levels. It is a story of America. It is a critique of American foreign policy. It is an investigation of the psyche. And it's about the psychic world, or the psychosphere we might say this control structure that runs America that's critiqued in the film is also critiqued in his other films and so we see similar patterns with uh, generational abuse and so forth Lolita eyes wide shut full metal jacket clockwork orange this system maintains its control over the masses through the real usage of social engineering and the mind control programs that we've discussed for Kubrick the shining is another film that within his canon displays the dark side of the spiritual phantasms that lie beyond the mirror of our world.